four recent Netflix movies going to get the review treatment here. We've got the uh, new holiday film, Holiday. We've got an Alfred Hitchcock remake called Rebecca. Uh, Over the Moon, a musical animated film from DreamWorks, and the star-studded The Devil All the Time. Let's get it started. Hey guys, Dan here. Thank you for joining me on Dan Reviews at another week of uh, Netflix movies. It's been a few weeks since we've done a whole Netflix wrap-up, but there's been uh, a small handful of movies piling up these last few weeks that uh, I wanted to get to before year's end, so why not put them all in one review for you and uh, get started that way. Please subscribe below if you haven't yet and comment. I love uh, conversing with you guys in the comments about whatever I'm reviewing, in this case some movies. Um, you know, I, I don't want to give spoilers for my reviews yet, but I would be very curious to hear from some of you out there about what you thought of these films. So let's kick it off with the Christmas-themed movie. Uh, my buddy Tim, who joins me on Dan Does Disney sometimes, has uh, informed me that this is more of a general holiday film, not exactly a Christmas film. But you know what? That's true. It goes through a whole year's worth of holidays, but it starts and ends at Christmas. There's a Christmas tree in the poster. I think it's Christmas, uh, and Netflix is going to actually be releasing a handful of Christmas movies as the weeks kind of progress here, but maybe they will get their own review at some point. I don't know, but for now, we're just going to talk about Holiday. This is uh, a rom-com with Emma Roberts and Luke Bracey as uh, the stars, and essentially, uh, Roberts plays Sloane, this young gal from Chicago who is really struggling with her uh, family around the holidays, specifically her mother, who is very judgmental, and she's tired of showing up to all these gatherings uh, single. So her aunt, who's played by Christian Chenoweth, fills her in on the holiday concept, which is someone that you uh, only meet with on holidays. You bring them to your family functions. You have a uh, you know several time a year relationship, but nothing more than that. So uh, she meets the uh, Luke Bracey character. Uh, what's his name? Um, Jackson, she meets, it's, it's such a classic, like, <laughs> Hallmark, uh, Lifetime Christmas movie name, Jackson. Uh, he is, uh, shopping, well, actually, he's returning some, uh, clothing from his, uh, ex, who we kind of meet in the intro as well. We see that he's having a rotten Christmas as well with, uh, with this girl and her family. Um, so he goes to return some of her items. They're having some problems at the register. Sloan is behind him in line, and so the two of them sort of hit it off in uh, a frenemy sort of way and uh, decide to become their uh, holidays after they see each other, um, you know, for – this is after Christmas, so obviously – First Christmas has passed, but she's going to get him to be her holiday uh, many times over. They have a chance encounter at Valentine's Day, and then from then on, they're like, let's be holidays. So, look, uh, right from the start, I was not really looking forward to this. I thought it looked um, kind of corny. I don't love holiday romantic comedies. I don't mind holiday movies. Um, there's certainly some that I am fond of. I love the Jim Carrey version of The Grinch. Uh, I love Dennis Leary and The Ref. Uh, you know, some of the classics before that even, you know, I, I like um, some of the, the Christmas Carol versions and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what else from, from way back in the day, obviously, like the Charlie Brown Christmas, of course, it's not really a movie, but, um, but anyway, there's a, a pattern these days to have like 25, 30, 35 new Christmas movies every year between Lifetime and Hallmark, and now Netflix is getting in to the game as well. Um, but some of them I do like. I, I rather enjoyed last year's Last Christmas. Um, so every so often there will be a rom-com uh, for the holiday season that kind of pops. And uh, this one actually, I'll say it, it is definitely better than I thought it was going to be. I really thought it was going to be um, maybe not horrible, but just very generic and even the poster it's like you know emma roberts is giving this glare at at the luke bracy character and it's like all right you know we get it she's already annoyed in the poster um and right from the start there's a lot of coarse language in the opening scene even which um you know look for me i don't care 
obviously some of the ones I mentioned, you know, the ref has a lot of a lot of uh, language in it. But I feel like when we're looking at a rom-com, a classic Christmas rom-com, obviously you're not going to have a lot of language, a lot of salty sex stuff on a Lifetime Christmas movie. So, you, can, you know, you, you stick it to a theatrical release or in this case a Netflix release. Um, I think they go to that well too many times. I definitely think this uh, movie is more coarse than it needs to be. Uh, I think they can get the point across with a few F-bombs, a couple of sexual statements, innuendos, what have you. Um, but this this really dives in, and, and I'm not sure that it's going to necessarily be for the Christmas movie set because of that. Um, and as a rom-com, well, it hits a lot of the, the key tropes that we see in rom-com. So how is the chemistry between the two leads? Well, look, Emma Roberts is a real cutie. She's, you know, every, she's just adorable, you know. I don't know if she gets that from her Aunt Julia Roberts or what, but she's just so cute and so likable. I don't really know Luke Bracey, I don't think. Let me see if I know him from anything. Okay, well, he was in Monte Carlo, G.I. Joe Retaliation, The November Man, Point Break, and Hacksaw Ridge. I've seen all five of those things, but I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Obviously, he was not the star of any of these movies. So for all intents and purposes, I don't really remember him in there. Um, but I thought he did a really good job here. I mean, I, I think their chemistry is believable. I think they're very cute together. I think the wrap-up scene, we don't really do spoilers on this channel, so... I'm not going to really talk about what happens, but if you've ever seen a Christmas movie or a romantic comedy, uh, there are some things that you might sense are coming and maybe a big speech coming towards the end. Um, you know, so it, it definitely hits a lot of those natural beats that we see in the Christmas rom-coms. But, um, you know, look, the cast is game for this. Christian Chenoweth is great in everything. Sometimes she's, you know, a little bit, too hammy. Uh, here, I think it's the right amount. You know, the the slutty aunt, she's okay, you know, with that. Um, and some of the side characters as well are, are okay. A um, couple of people in here that, that I haven't really seen uh, doing much in a while, including Dan Laria, who was the dad on The Wonder Years. He has a minor role in this. Uh, Alex Moffat from SNL, who's one of my favorite players on there right now. He plays um, the husband to um, Sloane's sister, so, you know, the cast is, I would say, not A-listers, but um, sometimes I think that can be distracting in a movie like this, too. I mean, yeah, we know Emma Roberts, but she's not she's not Julia Roberts. So I think um, we can get a little more lost in her character because of that. Um, so, yes, overall, this was definitely more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be. Um, too much with the harsh language, though, and, and the sex talk. I, I think that might turn off some of the Hallmark and Lifetime Christmas people. Um, but for me, it, it was not bad. I'm going to leave Holiday with a B-. minus. So up next, we're going to talk about Rebecca. This is an Alfred Hitchcock um, remake. And, of, of course, it was originally based on a book just a few years before the Alfred Hitchcock version. But this was uh, really... What got Hitchcock's name out there to the mass audience? He uh, he had done a, you know a few silent films, a few um, you know early thriller type things, but he won. Uh, well, he didn't win, I guess. Uh, you know, famously, he never won a competitive Oscar, but the movie won Best Picture uh, back in 1940, I believe. So you know, a, a lot to hold up to, and uh, I have not seen. The original Rebecca and I purposely didn't for this interview or for this review because um, I was just kind of thinking well I, spoilers for my review this movie is not good and I feel like if I watched the Hitchcock version as well to compare it I would like this version even less so I just kind of thought you know what let's just leave this movie the way it is as it is, and I'll review Rebecca 2020 with no sort of outside influence. Um, and in this movie, basically, uh, a, a, a new, um, a young newlywed, I should say, uh, arrives at her husband's uh, family estate, big sprawling estate um, on an English coast, and finds herself um, basically up against the image of his first wife, Rebecca, who died, and her her 
sort of presence, uh, you know, lingers in the house, lives on, uh, as you might say. So she is played by Lily James, the uh, the young newlywed, uh, and then Maxim, the new husband, is played by Army Hammer, and uh, Mrs. Danvers is uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, and she basically. Um, is you know kind of watching over this uh, state. She's the housekeeper sort of thing, um, and so a couple problems right off the bat is Hollywood keeps trying to make Army Hammer happen, and I don't necessarily dislike Army Hammer in theory. You know, I see him pop up on talk shows. He seems charming. He's obviously a good-looking dude, but um, he keeps being pushed into doing these different types of films. And he just doesn't have the acting range to do hardly any of them. Um, I think probably his best stuff came earlier in his career. Things like The Social Network, uh, Mirror Mirror, which wasn't all that great of a movie, but he was okay in it. Um, but the things I've seen him in lately, you know, Call Me By Your Name, I, I thought was very overrated. And this movie, Rebecca, he just is so lifeless. Um, you know, he, I, I feel like you need to do more than just stand there, be attractive, be sort of imposing, I guess. Um, but the acting just isn't there. Uh, and Lily James's acting is not that good either. Now, that I think can be a little bit more past because the character itself, um, I, I think is designed to not have much personality. She's basically there as a stand-in for this Rebecca, you know, figure. She's basically trying to emulate Rebecca, um, but, you know, her, her, her actual character hardly exists. So, okay, I'll, I'll give her a pass for that. Now, Kristen Scott Thomas is very good here. She's usually good, no surprise. But the whole movie is so lifeless. Um, you know, it, it's got some lush scenery, I'll give it that, you know, the, the whole English, um, you know, sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, just sort of the beautiful sprawling, you know, hills of England, uh, or what have you, beautiful. Um, but time-wise, I'm not sure if we're making sense with where we are, you know, they, they left it in place in the 30s, but I don't feel like some of the characters act like they might have in the 30s. They're more attuned to, you know, today's characters and what they might do in 2020. I'm not saying they're using, you know, slang. I'm not saying, you know, Rebecca or, uh, you know, Lily James is coming in and saying, oh, you know, this this is lit. You know, she's not doing that. But just some of the choices made, you know, the 30s for women was a more reserved time. And a lot of the things that are happening in this movie, I'm just like, I don't, I, that's not believable to me. I don't know that these characters would do this. And yet, I don't really know these characters anyway. So maybe they would. You know, it, it's hard to kind of get to know any of them to begin with. Now, this was directed by Ben Wheatley, who I didn't know the name, but he did uh, the recent action comedy movie Free Fire, which I thought was okay. I feel like I gave it like a C plus, something in that range. Um, and he's done, you know, a couple other movies as well. And he is English, um, unlike a lot of the actors in the movie. But, you know, you sort of get a sense of, well, maybe Lily James is. I don't know. Kristen Scott Thomas, I believe, is. But, um, okay, so Lily James is actually English. Army Hammer is absolutely not. And he seems just to be sort of lost <laughs> in, in this character and not in a good way, you know. Um, but so the direction is is also very sort of slow paced. This is this runs a, a bit over two hours and it feels every minute of it. You know, I, I really could not wait for uh, this to be done. Um, there's a few twists and turns in it, I suppose, but I feel like. Uh, the Hitchcock touch would be that much better with any twists. Um, now, I, I didn't look up, sometimes I will, at least even if I didn't see the original movie, look up sort of a comparison and contrast of like what this movie does that the original movie didn't or that the book didn't. Um, but from what I understand, the Hitchcock movie and the book uh, were very, very close 
to one another. So I think whatever this movie does differently, it's going to do it differently from both the book and the original Hitchcock movie. But either way, I mean, this was just a snore. Army Hammer, you know, maybe there's a place for him in Hollywood. I feel like maybe his place could be more in like like a true detective type thing perhaps you know like a a, a an 8 to 10 episode arc story that maybe he can sink his teeth into the character more but boy i don't know he just is one of these guys that i think they just need to stop with put him out to pasture find other actors for these roles uh, i'm going to leave rebecca with a d plus up next, uh, let's talk about Over the Moon. This is a, uh, a DreamWorks animated musical, and uh, essentially this, this gal builds a rocket ship um, and is trying to meet this mythical moon goddess. Um, her mom you know, has passed away, and so she's um, trying to figure out if this moon goddess is real and, and, and head up there. It's from the same crew um, that made Abominable. So, you know, DreamWorks has obviously a couple different branches, and this one is from Pearl Studio. Uh, it's their second feature after Abominable, which I thought was okay. I liked Smallfoot uh, significantly better than Abominable, but how did this one uh, work out for me? Well, first of all, um, we have a few famous uh, voices in the cast. None of really the main characters, but um, we've got Ken Jeong, uh, who they meet partway through the movie. We've got John Cho as uh, Fifi's father, or Fei Fei. Uh, Margaret Cho is one of Fei Fei's aunts, and Sandra Oh shows up as well um, as Fei Fei's stepmother. So they, uh, you know, those are sort of the supporting cast. The lead cast, Kathy uh, Ong, or Ang, is, uh, is Fei Fei. And then uh, her new stepbrother, who is uh, eight years old, is named uh, his the actor rather is Robert G. Chu. So I don't know them, um, but you know th they do an okay job. Actually, uh, the little kid Chin, uh, he's he's one of the best parts of this movie. Um, the first like. 30, 35 minutes of this movie actually is really well done. It's very emotional with the whole loss of the mother thing. Now, of course, that's a classic, you know, Disney animated trope from way back, you know, in the 30s. Um, but all right, you know, it's, it's acceptable, you know. Parents uh, do die and, and kids need to learn how to deal with that in today's day and age, just like they did back in the early Disney days. So, okay, fine, a little trite, but we'll, we'll accept it um, because they do have some uh, emotional moments that involve that. But the music is okay at best. Um, I don't think there's any songs that are necessarily that memorable. Some are okay um, and they're sung, you know, fine enough. But when I think of even even DreamWorks movies with songs, you know, there's certainly better choices than these. They're they're not, um, you know, really memorable. But you know, they they move the plot along enough. Although some of them are oddly specific. Like for example, like in Frozen. Okay, Let It Go is such a great, powerful song because it can be adapted to anything. You know, there's there's so many ways you can use Let It Go. A lot of these songs in this movie, they like name drop specific characters and specific plot points. And it's like, okay, well, you're definitely moving the plot along, I guess. But like, I wouldn't find myself singing this song outside of this movie because it wouldn't make any sense in a different context, you know? Um, so that's, that's one problem other than, you know, them just not being that memorable. Um, but the first like I said, about 30, 35 minutes is really well done. The, the characters come together, you know, the dynamic between her and the stepbrother is really believable. Uh, and really her and the new stepmother who she cannot stand, you know, trying to replace the, the deceased mother, all of that. It's all really well done, you know, believable. The animation's decent, um, the music's okay. But then we get to the moon about halfway through this movie, maybe a little before, and everything just falls apart from there um it's 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 like super bright and colorful and in your face and like you're on acid it's it's like a lot like alice in wonderland like like it just the colors are crazy and this the the people she meets up there are crazy and um that's where we meet the ken jong character so of course he's crazy because he's ken jong and just everything is like sensory overload the songs get even worse 
um, because now we're at this – well, I don't do spoilers, but like basically on the moon, it's a whole different kind of – you know universe obviously and so she encounters a bunch of different people but it's like they're all way over the top the story completely falls apart um and and just the last like hour of this movie is just not enjoyable it, it's really unfortunate because i thought it started out very well and then uh really it's it's not even halfway through and it just goes to crap um so i i, I can't grade over the moon too high but What's interesting is if this were a half hour short, I think this would be like an A minus. Like it's you know the songs notwithstanding, maybe you know, but but it's beautiful imagery, emotional. Yes, you know some of the voice work is really well done. Um, the characterization is is great. So first half hour, yes, that's like an A minus, and then the last hour is just awful. So, you know, overall, I can't give this a positive grade. It's, it's definitely more bad time than good time. Um, and, it's, and it's very unfortunate. I, I really hate to, to do this. But, yeah, it's, it's just overall not that great. So I'm going to leave over the moon with a C. And I actually think that's generous. I mean, that really is just because the, uh, the initial half hour and the, and the setup is so well done. So I don't know what happened there, but lost its way for sure. So let's close with The Devil All the Time. Uh, this is actually probably one of the more high-profile ones of uh, the four that we're doing, but it is the oldest. It uh, premiered on Netflix, I believe, towards the end of September. Um, yeah, September 16th, in the middle of September. So, you know, we're, we're about two months back on this, but I, I thought it deserved a review because uh, it, it's got a lot of high-profile characters in it. And also, um, you know, it, it got a lot of buzz. I mean, it was in Netflix's top 10 when it came out for, for a couple of weeks. So um, essentially, this is based on a book as well um, from Donald Ray Pollock, who uh, becomes the narrator for the film version. But uh, the, uh, the book came out about nine years ago, and essentially it follows um, several different characters uh, that are all sort of, um, I don't know, they've all got problems. Let's, let's, let's just say that. Um, and we're in uh, Ohio here, slightly after World War II, and uh, some of it takes place in West Virginia as well. And uh, included here is a, a disabled war veteran, a husband and wife who uh, have a penchant for doing some illegal things, which I won't get into, and uh, a false preacher as well. So... There's a lot going on here, and this is one of these movies where all the stories eventually converge towards the end, and uh, that can be done very well, and it can also be done uh, not so well. This sort of falls somewhere in the middle, but among uh, the actors involved here are Tom Holland, Robert Pattinson, Sebastian Stan, uh, Bill Sarsgaard. So, you know, it's got a very, very high-profile uh, cast um there's there's other other names you might recognize that uh are in the movie as well that play slightly smaller parts riley kehoe jason clark mia wasikowska uh hayley bennett uh mia wasikowska is another one by the way they tried to make her happen for a long long time and she was in a couple of movies that i really liked but uh i i, I think they're hyping her up a little bit luckily her career never really took off anyway but um but anyway so uh the uh, movie version follows the book, you know, from what I understand, fairly closely. Um, but uh, you know, they add, of course, the narrator in to sort of, um, you know, give us some insight to these characters that maybe we would have gotten from the book, but that they uh, didn't end up conveying on the screen. The director here is uh, Antonio Campos, and uh, he and I'm going to assume his brother, Paulo Campos, maybe it's his cousin, I don't know, maybe it's his father. Um, they co-wrote the screenplay together, but uh, he uh, directed this, and uh, it's one of his first, like, full-length features that he's directed. Uh, he's directed a couple of TV episodes, but, uh, you know, nothing really high-profile like this. Um, and I kind of think it shows. This one is a frustrating movie, uh, and I do admit that this may deserve a second watch. I wasn't going to waste another two hours and 20 minutes watching it a second time uh, in one week. But before the year's over, I may actually give this another try because it may be one that you need to watch a couple of times. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, the Rotten Tomatoes score is 64%, so that tells me it's certainly mixed. 
and I am definitely more on the lower end of the mix. And here's why. Um, but let's get to the good, I guess. So first of all, a lot of the performances here are very good. You expect this from a lot of these people, uh, specifically Robert Pattinson, who is um, becoming really one of the, the true great young actors in Hollywood. And I liked him. I don't like the Twilight movies, but ever since Water for Elephants, I thought, okay, this dude is more than just a pretty face in Twilight. Um, those movies are dumb, but this Water for Elephants, you know, he's, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Reese Witherspoon. He's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Christoph Waltz, and he's being believable. He's a good actor, and many things I've seen him in since have bolstered that opinion. I thought he was uh, excellent in The Lighthouse, which was either last year or the year before. I think it was last year um, was The Lighthouse, but um, he is, I think, the best here in this movie, although Jason Clark, as always, does a good job as well. Tom Holland is okay. I really think um, Holland is not quite ready for some of these more dramatic roles that he's taking on. He was in The Current War as well about, um, you know, the electricity kind of stuff 100 years ago, whatever it was, and he was, like, okay in that, but as a movie, that was kind of only okay, but um, but I really, you know, for everybody here, I think he's okay, but he didn't blow me away like some of these other actors uh, did. So, okay, the acting's pretty good overall. We'll give it that. Um, cinematography is pretty good. Editing, a train wreck. Uh, the screenplay, all over the place. Um, the main problem with this movie is there's way too much going on and um, having the narrator is good. However, I feel like the narrator is dropping plot points along the way with either stuff that we just saw, so like useless, or giving away things that might have been interesting as a twist down the line in the movie. So I, I don't know how effective the narrator was in helping us with the story because he was either ruining things or telling us things that we just saw and we already know about. So, sort of useless, but okay, not the worst part of the movie. The worst part, really, of the movie is that all of these stories are way too convoluted. Yes, they do converge at the end, like a lot of movies uh, in this vein, but the slow burn um, should give us more time to appreciate these characters, and most of the characters we don't even really get to know. Everyone's so miserable in this movie, so we get to know that. It's, this is not, and, and this is, you know, maybe a reason I didn't want to watch it a second time in a week. I mean, it is really depressing. It's one of these that's, like, kind of hard to watch because everybody's miserable and everybody's lives stink, and, you know, they're trying to get out of it, and they do so by screwing over other people, and it's like, it's just a downer of a movie, which I don't necessarily mind, but I'm not going to watch it twice in a week, um, you know, just to hope to get something out of it you know, that I didn't the first time. But, like I said, I may give it a go before the end of the year, because I think there's a lot of good pieces here, but we just, we don't really, or I didn't anyway, care about any of these characters, because other than they're miserable, we don't really get a whole lot of character development, motivation, um, other than, like, to get out of their miserable lives. Uh, and I think that really affected my watching of it, because, yes, it's a slow burn, but maybe... Give us something to hold on to, something to identify with um, other than, you know, they're just in a miserable place, so they do miserable things. Okay, fine. You know, 2020 sucks. I'm in a miserable place. You know, I think a lot of us are. I don't do the things these guys do, so help, help me figure out why these people are so desperate to do all of the things that they're doing in the film. So uh, it's it's a real mixed bag. I wanted to like it uh, because I had heard that the performances were great. I, I heard that it was really good. It was obviously in Netflix's top 10 for a while, but it just didn't come together for me. So I think I'm going to leave Devil all the time with a benefit of the doubt C because I would like to see it again. It may be one of these movies where a second viewing will, um, you know, entice me to see things that I wasn't seeing the first time. Uh, I don't know. Some some slow burn movies are like that. Others I dislike even more on the second view. Um, you know, but I will give it a benefit of the doubt and leave it with a C. Um, and look, the performances, I think, are, are good enough to at least not have it, 
much lower than that. I think maybe a C minus, okay, but you know, Robert Pattinson's firing on all cylinders here. Jason Clark, great. Um, you know, Riley Kehoe's really good. So there's things to like here, but I just didn't think it came together nearly as well as uh, they probably wanted it to. So that is my piece on the devil all the time. All right, so that will do it. Um, we uh, let's see next week. I think we may have a bunch of uh, regular on-demand movies, or there may be enough on streamers right now. I know Disney Plus just dropped a movie recently, so I'll have to, I'll have to see what other movies are around. But we're coming up on um, a lot of these movies that were released theatrically in August and early September are now coming out on DVD. So we may get to a lot of those, too, on Hinged and The New Mutants and Writing on Bathroom Walls. And a lot of these are, are hitting the DVD shelves within the next week or two, so I will finally get to see them. Uh, a couple of them I've actually already seen. So that may be next week. I don't know. But uh, other than that, we will have probably a Netflix holiday roundup come Christmas time because I know they're going to be releasing a lot of holiday movies in the next few weeks. So uh, thank you for watching. Comment below, subscribe, like, all of the good stuff, um, and we'll see you next time.